Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, What's New in Robotics and Minimally Invasive Therapy for Prostate Cancer and Prostate Disease. I am Brenda Kelly Kim, LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking site, and we are proud to bring you this interactive web seminar. For more information, please visit us at www.labroots.com. Here's how the presentation works. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments, or answers can be submitted via the green Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. If time permits, we'll get to your questions at the end of the presentation. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button in the top right or the Q&A button in the lower left. In addition, we want to let our audience know that this presentation has been approved for continuing educational credit. If you want to obtain the credits, please click on the Get Your Free CME CE button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of our speakers and presentations. Please select the CE CME button under your presentation and follow the instructions to claim your certificate. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Herbert Lepore, MD, is one of the leading experts in the field of prostate cancer. He's currently the Martin Spetz Chairman of the Department of Urology and the Director of the Smilo Comprehensive Prostate Care Center at the NYU Langone Medical Center in New York. Dr. David M. Albala is Chief of Urology at Krauss Hospital in Syracuse, New York, and Medical Director for Associated Medical Professionals. He's considered a national and international authority in laparoscopic and robotic surgery and has been an active teacher in this year for over 20 years. His research and clinical interests have focused on robotic urological surgery. In addition, Dr. Albala is a past White House fellow who acted as a special assistant to Federico Pena, Secretary of Transportation, on classified and unclassified public health related issues. To learn more about either of our speakers, please click on their names. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Laporte to start us off. It's a pleasure to participate in this debate, open versus robotic assisted laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. So in the year 2015, about 80% of radical prostatectomies in the US will be performed via robotic approach. So was the adoption of the robot driven by evidence-based improvements of oncological functional outcomes or significant cost reduction or disingenuous marketing by industry, hospitals, and surgeons. Well, who cares, some may say. Let's move on, since everyone's doing the robot and trainees no longer exposed to the open approach. We all need to care. New technology is often costly and adoption associated with the learning curve. We need to protect the consumer and the payers of health care. There must be a legitimate process for evaluation and adoption of new technology. So, why didn't I jump on the robot bandwagon? Well, in the early 2000s, the major limitation of open radical prostatectomy was post-prostatectomy sexual dysfunction. At that time, my length of stay following radical prostatectomy was less than two days. Hospital mortality in over 3,000 cases at that time, zero. Less than 1% intraoperative perioperative complications. Transfusion rates of 4%. Half the men were back to work in two weeks, 97% urinary continence. And so I speculated that magnification and thermal dissection of the neurovascular bundle simply would not improve sexual function. So I believe radical prostatectomy filled an unmet niche for the surgical robot rather than the robot addressing a legitimate limitation of open radical prostatectomy. I predicted that the robot would not improve outcomes, and that's what I'll show you today in this debate. I did not anticipate that savvy marketing would drive patient care and not medical evidence. So this is some of the uh, marketing. I believe this is at the, the stadium uh, with uh, the Red Sox. Robotic-assisted surgery made me famous. Bringing it to Brighton makes me proud. This is sort of what I deal with up the street. Uh, here in New York City from uh, Dr. Samadhi's website. That's splitting the muscle and putting it on traction for three to four hours 
causes a lot of pain. That's a longer recovery. If you were just using your hands and you're working in blind spots, you can damage the sphincter. That leads to incontinence. You can leave cancer behind under the pubic bone because those are the blind spots. Is this disingenuous marketing or is this evidence-based medicine? Uh, let's see. So if we wanted to do a comparative effectiveness of open versus robotic radical prostatectomy, we need to consider these outcomes at this, in this priority. Oncologic control, operative and perioperative complications, quality of life outcomes, and cost. And then there is really uh, those outcomes of really less importance, blood loss, cosmetics, length of stay, and whether you use a pubic tube uh, versus a, a Foley catheter. Now, there are many factors that influence a comparative effectiveness of open versus robotic radical prostatectomy. For example, disease characteristics. If you're comparing two groups, open versus robot, were they similar Gleason score, clinical stage, and serum PSA? How about patient characteristics? Were the baseline urinary and sexual function equivalent, age and comorbidities? Very important. I'll show you this uh, with some very compelling evidence. Surgeon experience and technical abilities. Is, were, were the hospitals, uh, were they metro balanced by metropolitan versus rural, tertiary center versus community hospital? Were clinical pathways uh, equivalent? And the outcome assessment, was it prospective or retrospective? Were there instruments for assessing outcomes and was there uh, an attempt to reduce investigator bias? Well, uh, the feasibility of a randomized comparative effect in the study uh, is, it, it, it's, it's just simply not practical. And however, it really would give us the ultimate answer. It would give us the, uh, so based on all the confounders of comparative effectiveness, uh, a randomized study is necessary to definitively compare open versus robotic radical prostatectomy. However, uh, a randomized study would be cost prohibitive and not feasible since surgeons and patients are not willing to submit to randomization. So the methodology for comparing open versus robotic radical pro how can we do this uh, in the absence of a randomized study? Well, if we're going to look uh, at the comparative effectiveness, again, we must consider the surgeons of equivalent experience. There must be uniform clinical pathways for pain management, transfusion, hospital discharge, and readmission. Really needs to be central pathology. Validated outcome instruments must be used. The surgeon should be uninvolved in data accrual, entry, or retrieval, uh, and efforts must be uh, made uh, to adjust for author bias. So in this debate, I will not show you a single comparison of single surgeon experiences from different institutions. I will show you no meta-analysis because it's basically garbage in, garbage out. No single surgeon comparing their personal open and robotic outcomes. It just shows that that surgeon is a better open or robotic surgeon. I will rely on single institution with high volume surgeons and uniform clinical pathways and pathology assessment and large administrative databases still recognizing uh, that there are inherent limitations of this literature. This is one of the most important slides. Uh, and what it shows is robotic versus open radical prostatectomy, the differential effect of regionalization, procedure volume, and operative approach. And this comes from the nationwide sample. Now, if you notice uh, with the open in the dotted blue and the robotic in the dotted red, so on the x-axis is annual hospital case volume. So when you look at hospitals that perform less than 50 cases, uh, there are significant complications in both the open and robotic groups. So you sometimes hear that, that well, you know, maybe the robot doesn't make a, a, a good surgeon better. It makes a bad surgeon uh, a better bad surgeon. Uh, well, I would say bad surgeons shouldn't be doing this. And what you can see is a low volume robotic surgeon has the same complications uh, that a low volume open surgeon would have. Uh, and similarly, uh, in uh, experienced open robotic surgeons uh, can perform this operation safely. And we'll come back to this. 
So let's look at positive surgical margins. I believe uh, this is really uh, one of the very best studies in the literature. Uh, it comes from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, the open and robotic uh, cases were performed by highly experienced uh, surgeons. In fact, uh, there was twice the number of robotic cases as open cases. There was a single group of pathologists and the positive surgical margin rate was 14% uh, versus 8%, the, ro the robot versus the open. And when they made all of the uh, uh, adjustments, uh, the conclusion was that men undergoing a, a robotic-assisted laparoscopic radical prostatectomy were about two times more likely to have a positive surgical margin compared to uh, the open approach when both procedures were performed by experts. Positive surgical margin, again, was adjusted for preoperative uh, uh, disease risk. Now, here's another study from Memorial, Sloan Kettering, where, again, this was 2007 and, and, and 2010, and this was 1,454 men, uh, and all of the uh, surgeons were high-volume surgeons, both open uh, and robotic. And in this case, uh, the surgical approach had no impact on positive surgical margins or, or recurrence. Now let's go to Hopkins uh, between the years 2005 and, and 2011. Again, we're looking at a group of highly experienced open and robotic surgeons. Uh, and if you look at the, the number of procedures, again, it shows the, that the, these were uh, on average high volume surgeons. Uh, the mean length of stay at Hopkins if you had the row open was significantly less than if you had the robot. The off-pathway discharge, typically uh, because of, uh, again, some, some factor causing delay, was significantly greater in the robotic group. And if you looked at the radical prostatectomy-specific complications, uh, they were significantly higher in the robot versus the, uh, the open cohort. So the robotic approach, independent predictor of increased off-pathway discharge uh, and radical prostatectomy-specific complications. Well, let's, let's go now to, to Vanderbilt. Uh, again, uh, highly uh, uh, experienced uh, open and robotic uh, uh, surgeons. And what did we learn from this institution's experience? Again, they had similar pathways and outcome instruments uh, for men undergoing open and robotic radical prostatectomy. Uh, and over the years, they reported no significant differences between the surgical approaches for length of stay for pain, for transfusion rates, for continent rates, for potency rates, for surgical margins when you corrected for pathologic stage, or biochemical recurrence. There was, uh, again, and the only uh, differentiation between the groups was greater blood loss associated with the open approach. Well, let's look at satisfaction, uh, and we'll turn to Duke. Uh, and I imagine some of these uh, cases may have been contributed uh, by Dr. Abala, uh, a good friend and colleague who is uh, debating the merits uh, uh, of the robotics. So at Duke, and this was between the years 2000 and 2007, uh, men undergoing the robotic radical prostatectomy were three times more likely uh, to regret undergoing their radical prostatectomy. And in subsequent publications, the greater satisfaction rate was felt to be attributed to uh, unrealistic expectations. Well, let's look uh, at the healthcare professions follow-up study to see if we can glean uh, some, uh, again, uh, reasonably reliable uh, comparative effectiveness observations. No significant difference in positive surgical margins and recurrences, uh, biochemical recurrences at three and five years, and no sig different, significant difference in health-related quality of life uh, outcomes. <clears throat> Now, I think this is really the best study uh, in the literature comparing open versus uh, robotic uh, functional outcomes. Again, this was reported by Mike Berry, uh, who is, uh, was a PI, and he's the chief of medicine at Mass General Hospital, who's an expert in health policy. He does not care if, the, uh, if his study shows an advantage to the open uh, versus the robot. Uh, he's just trying to get to the uh, answer using uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the optimal uh, methodology. So questionnaires were sent to Medicare participants undergoing radical prostatectomy between August 2008 uh, and December of uh, 2008. 
And this is very important because this was in the post-adoption era for the robot. And since prostate cancer surgery, the question asks, how much of a problem have you had leaking or dripping urine uh, or with sexual activity? And if you look at the open versus the robotic groups, there was actually when adjustments were made, uh, there was a significantly greater likelihood that men who had the robot uh, had uh, more likely uh, uh, probability of having uh, problems with their confidence and there was no clinically or statistically significant difference uh, in terms of sexual function. Uh, looking at, uh, again, uh, the, the complications, uh, and this was from uh, Gandaglia in 2014, uh, looking at the SEER Medicare database, uh, again, between October 2008 and December 2009, this is the post uh, adoption era for the robot, looking at uh, the robotic radical prostatectomy had significantly greater 30 and 90 day GU complications and miscellaneous complications. The robot had a lower risk of blood transfusion and a length of stay. There was no differences in post prostatectomy cancer treatments uh, and uh, the robotic uh, approach as one would expect uh, was uh, significantly more uh, costly. Uh, in terms of looking at cost, uh, uh, and we turn to the University uh, of Pittsburgh, where there was uni uniform pathways leading to hospital discharge, uh, men undergoing open radical prostatectomy admitted to a specialized uh, inpatient nursing unit, uh, and they looked at indirect costs uh, and included purchase and maintenance uh, of, of the robot. Uh, and again, uh, if you looked at length of stay, there was no significant differences between the two groups. Uh, the robotic approach uh, was, um, uh, uh, was, took longer to perform. And as you can see, a very significant difference uh, in, in cost. So let me sort of comment uh, on, uh, I think, some studies uh, that have been used that should show the advantages uh, of the, uh, the robot over the open. And let me sort of point out uh, some of the uh, 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 limitations of these studies. So this is positive surgical margin and perioperative complication rates of primary surgical treatments for prostate cancer, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Now, uh, this was the first author with Asha Tawari, but let's see who was one of the, uh, the authors. Let's look at D. Uh, this was Usha Seshardi uh, Creedon. And his affiliation is the Department of Clinical Affairs uh, at Intuitive Surgical. So do you think uh, that there is a potential uh, author bias uh, when uh, the head of uh, uh, clinical affairs from the robot is one of the uh, uh, primary authors? I would, have, I would be very suspect. So what did they do? Uh, they took 400 original articles that were published between 2000 and 2010. Now that's deceptive because uh, these articles were published during that era, but as I'll show you, uh, there's a real uh, difference in when these cases were performed. The radical prostatectomies were actually performed uh, between 1990 and 2000. Uh, and we know that robotic radical prostatectomies were not performed until after the year 2000. So there was no correction for the year of, of surgery. And what happened during this interval of time was something very uh, significant, and that was PSA uh, testing, uh, which uh, greatly uh, changed uh, uh, the, uh, the um, detection. Uh, profile of the cancers of, of prostate cancers. So again, here is the uh, system, systematic review and we're going from 1982 to 2010. And let's look at when the uh, uh, open radical prostatectomies were, were performed. Uh, uh, the majority of these cases were actually performed in the pre-PSA era. Now let's look at the radical robotic uh, prostatectomy series. And of course, all of these uh, were performed uh, after the year 2000, uh, which again is in the, uh, the uh, post-PSA uh, era. So again, uh, you can see that this is apples and oranges. This is basically comparing uh, surgical margins uh, from the pre-PSA to the post-PSA uh, era. This is just uh, hopelessly uh, flawed. Now, these are uh, 
uh, uh, highlights from my publications. Uh, and when I published uh, 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 the complication rates uh, from uh, a, a surgical series of mine from 1994 to 2000, the positive surgical margin rate was 20%. Look what happened uh, in another study we published from the year 2000 to 2006. My positive surgical margin rate uh, was 9.8%. Uh, what accounted for this dramatic reduction uh, in positive surgical margin rate is not my learning curve because I've already done thousands by the time uh, this uh, in, uh, in 1994, but rather uh, it was uh, the uh, the... Uh, the, 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 the routine use of PSA uh, screening. And again, if you go back to the data uh, from the Tawari paper, those who underwent open had higher PSAs. Uh, they had uh, a greater likelihood uh, of having a PT3 disease. And so what you see uh, are, uh, are differences uh, in, uh, in, in, in positive surgical margin rates uh, that again are simply due uh, to uh, different cancers uh, that were being diagnosed uh, in this uh, in this era. Another study, uh, a multi-institutional, a multinational, multi-institutional study comparing positive surgical margin rates among 22,000 open laparoscopic and robotic assisted cases. Now, again, in this study, uh, they actually were looking at uh, men who had their surgery from a, a, a similar era, okay? And again, at first blush, you would uh, uh, interpret a significant uh, reduction uh, in positive surgical margins, uh, but uh, attributed to the robot. But again, uh, the devil is in the details. So this is actually a slide you can't read, but I'm going to highlight some of the important um, facts. Uh, and again, this is looking at the open versus the, the robotic experience. Now, again, this is showing you the centers, right? So you had one open center contributed 70% of the cases. And also look at this, 77% of the open cases had missing data non-randomized, missing data, no pathological standards, confounders, center versus surgeon. At what point do methodologic limitations just make a study uh, un uninterpretable? Uh, and again, this is looking at uh, uh, the open versus the, the, uh, the, the, the robotic uh, cases. Uh, again, recognizing that virtually all of the cases, the overwhelming majority of the 14 centers, uh, that you had basically uh, one uh, major uh, uh, open center. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this is really comparing one center versus uh, uh, 14. Uh, and again, many uh, of the open cases performed uh, at these uh, centers were being done by uh, low volume uh, uh, surgeons. So the unadjusted positive margin rate, there was uh, uh, an advantage to the robot. Uh, and after the adjustment, uh, they claimed there still was some differences. Uh, but the take home message for me is that at a high volume robotic center, uh, which was basically all but one center, uh, you should uh, not have an open there. Now let's talk a minute about uh, some of the functional outcomes. So be very careful when you look at the systematic reviews. So again, this was reported by uh, FICARA, uh, and what they uh, reported was 51 articles published between January 2008 and August 2011. 84% of these had level three or four evidence. That's why I say garbage in, garbage out. There was no uniform methodology for reporting and confidence, no quality control for reporting outcomes, and they assessed the confidence at, uh, at, one, uh, at one year. So let me just give you an example of one of those studies that contributed uh, to this uh, meta-analysis by Tawari. They looked at 300 men who underwent radical prostatectomy at Henry Ford Hospital between October 1999 and December 2002. There was 100 open versus 200 robotic cases. If you actually go through this, because uh, there were seven open surgeons, 
uh, and one team performed all the robotic cases. Basically, uh, there were five cases per open surgeon per year versus 70 cases per robotic surgeon per year. So again, you have an expert robotic surgeon and basically inexperienced uh, open surgeons are certainly extremely low volume open surgeons. That's not a fair comparison. And of the 300 cases, only 120 or 40% participated in a phone interview. And 60% were simply lost to follow up. Now, this is a study that was recently published, and again, let me just highlight some of the pitfalls, uh, because at, at first blush, it really looks like we're finally going to get the answer. This is by Hagland uh, et al. They reported a prospective study, uh, a controlled, non-randomized comparative study of seven open versus seven robotic centers uh, in Sweden. Quest quality of life questionnaire completed at baseline in one year, and it was sent to a data monitoring center. This is great. It takes uh, out uh, investigator bias. There was uniform definition of confidence and potency. Uh, again, a, 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 an important uh, um, um, strength of the study. And again, of the 26, 25 uh, cases, 93% completed the one-year evaluation. So really, very few were lost to follow-up. So there was no significant difference between the baseline PSA, Gleason score, IIEF, IPSS amongst the two groups. So these were really, um, you know, uh, uh, well balanced uh, for what one might think would be co-confounders of outcome. Now, men undergoing open radical prostatectomy, however, were significantly more likely to live in the rural area, be less educated, have higher baseline BMI, and a higher uh, ASA classification. Now, this is very important. Overall, there were 778 uh, open cases and 1,847 robotic cases over a three-year interval. So what does that really translate to? At the open hospitals, they were performing 37 per radicals per year versus 88 at the robot. Now, remember that slide I uh, showed you earlier on showing you that really it is the experience uh, at the or the hospital volume uh, that is a, a very important predictor of, uh, of outcomes. Look where 30 cases per year uh, would put you on this complication list. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, it, you know, the, the, this is a, a hospitals that you would expect high complications. And look where uh, the 90 cases uh, of the rope, you're already seeing uh, the curves uh, flatten out. So uh, this was really comparing low volume open to uh, intermediate volume uh, robotic centers. And again, if you looked at the outcomes, change the pad at least once a day, it was 20% in the open versus 21% uh, in the robot. And actually, if you look at that, because uh, the confidence intervals don't overlap, there would be an advantage um, uh, to, the, uh, to the open. Now, let's look at the IIEF. This is very important. So what this is basically saying, uh, or if you looked at penile stiffness in less than 50% of the cases, let's look at that. Uh, so that was 81% uh, uh, in the open really would have significant erectile dysfunction where they had an unreliable uh, 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 erection versus 77% in the robot. So again, this became marginally statistically significant uh, because uh, of the large sample size. But would you consider an 81% uh, versus 77% risk of ED uh, to be a significant difference? I wouldn't, but that was uh, statistically significant, and that led uh, to the conclusion of robot superiority over the open. And if you looked at the oncological outcomes, there was no difference. So is the superior results of robotic uh, approach real? Is a potency rate of 19% versus 23% clinically significant? I don't think so. Now, this is also something of great uh, concern. If, again, I said there was equivalent baseline Gleason score and PSA, why did 32% of the men undergoing an open not undergo a nerve-sparing procedure versus only 16% of those undergoing the robotic approach? 
So this is really almost a comparison uh, of the merits of nerve sparing. Now, do we think that rural men with less education were offered equivalent penile rehabilitation and ED treatment by open surgeons who are less likely to perform nerve sparing procedures compared to robotic surgeons? I don't think so. So what can we conclude from the recent Swedish study? Uh, that it's basically a comparison of low volume open versus intermediate volume robotic centers with no correction for hospital volume. Low volume open centers and intermediate volume robotic centers achieve comparable confidence and oncologic, and oncologic outcomes. Potency rates at one year are poor for both open and robotic centers, and the difference we see between these two groups may be statistically, but it's certainly not clinically significant and the negligible difference in potency rate due to surgeon experience, selection bias, inconsistent pathway for treating post prostatectomy ED, and the low rate of nerve sparing in the open group. So robotic radical prostatectomy has less blood loss. I would say, so what? Oncologic and functional outcomes are equivalent or inferior with a robotic approach. Uh, we've shown that the amount of blood loss does not influence oncologic or functional outcomes. So less blood loss does not translate to improved outcomes. And again, uh, uh, that's what uh, the, uh, the literature shows. The Vanderbilt experience has shown that the robotic approach is associated with one unit less blood loss over the open, which may influence recovery. But I've also shown if you use erythrocyte stimulating proteins, you'll actually increase the blood volume by one unit. So the only advantage of the robotic approach is really less blood loss. So a comparative effectiveness, which is really what this debate is all about in 2015, what can we say? The only inherent advantage of robotic radical prostatectomy is less blood loss. That's it. The only inherent advantage of open radical prostatectomy is less cost. I have to say, when you really look at the highest level of uh, comparative uh, effectiveness literature, the preponderance of evidence shows no inherent advantage of the robotic as it relates to length of stay, complications, oncologic outcomes, or quality of life, life outcomes. In fact, uh, high quality evidence suggests an inferiority. The robot is simply a bad investment for improving outcomes. I would have to say that the most cost-effective strategy for improving outcomes is for radical prostatectomies to be performed at centers performing high volumes of open radical prostatectomy. So that really is the case uh, for, the, uh, for the open radical prostatectomy. There, there, there certainly uh, is a, a learning curve with new technology, as we saw with the robot, but you justify that learning curve by ultimately reducing complications or lowering costs. The robot uh, does not lower complication, does not lower uh, oncologic outcomes, does not improve functional outcomes. It's simply more costly, and there's really nothing to justify uh, the significant uh, uh, adoption learning curve. Uh, in, uh, and in 2015, uh, I think we have to say the robot really did not advance the field of treating localized prostate cancer. Good afternoon and welcome to our debate on robotic prostatectomy versus open prostatectomy. I'm Dave Albala, Chief of Urology at Krauss Hospital, and it's indeed a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I would like to share the robotic prostatectomy perspective. And the real question to us, is this a surgical advantage or a marketing ploy? You've heard from my debater, Dr. Lepore, my good friend at NYU, and now I will show you the robotic material and let you make the final decision on what you think is best for your patients, open prostatectomy or robotic prostatectomy.
If we look back and think about what our goals were for robotic prostatectomy back in 2000, we wanted to establish a minimally invasive option and attempt to make laparoscopic prostatectomy a more feasible option for a larger number of surgeons. This procedure, as many of you know, is extremely difficult to perform and was limited to some very skilled laparoscopic surgeons. Initially, when we started with robotics and laparoscopic procedures, the instrumentation was primitive and the approach was primitive. But I think over the years, we've achieved goals and expectations well beyond our initial expectations. The approach and expectations of robotic prostatectomy have evolved significantly since the year 2000 and continue to evolve. If we look at where the robotic installations have been across the United States as well as across the world, you can see almost 2,000 robots are in the United States with 220 in Asia and 430 in Europe. Australia, the Middle East, and Latin America are far behind with 25 robots apiece. But when we look, at least in the United States, when we compare open prostatectomy with robotic prostatectomy, practice patterns have begun to change. You can see in the red is the, uh, ro uh, is the radical open retropubic prostatectomy as popularized by Patrick Walsh and what my esteemed colleague, Dr. Lepore, has talked about. In 2010, you can see that these numbers have dwindled. In the green line, you can see are the robotic prostatectomies. And indeed, in 2004, there were very few performed and then today, as you can see, that number has surpassed open prostatectomy across the board. Is robotic surgery only market driven as my colleague has tried to uh, parlay and show to us? Indeed, we've seen articles in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, as well as the Seattle Times talking about robotic surgery, its growth, but many questions exist. And indeed, I think patient expectations um, are incredibly important to have patients realize what the robot can do. As robotic surgeons, managing these expectations beyond the hype is a challenge. And indeed, reporting these outcomes has been difficult and trying to get patients to understand the technicalities that are involved with robotic surgery can pose to be a challenge. In fact, as Dr. Lepore mentioned, this was an article that I wrote with my colleagues at Duke University in which patients that underwent robotic prostatectomy were more likely to be regretful and dissatisfied, possibly because of the high expectations of a new procedure. When I first started doing this procedure, expectations were high. Patients came in wanting to have this procedure done, and indeed, expectations were exceeded were, uh, with open prostatectomy when we compared them to robotic prostatectomy early on. I think I didn't do a good job to explain patients what the outcomes would be of these patients. We were still on our learning curve, but I think much has changed since this publication that I was a part of at Duke University. We now know from the literature that robotic assistance does offer superior outcomes when we compare them to laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. There's less pain, smaller incisions, less scarring, and a faster recovery. And indeed, if we start to look at some of the, the literature, Andy Vickers in 2012 looked at this in a publication in Urology and stated, you know, the great meaningless questions in urology, which is better? open laparoscopic or robotic radical prostatectomy. And it should be obvious what is better, open, pure, or laparoscopic or robotic is really meaningless outside the context of the learning curve. As you can see, Matt Cooperberg in San Francisco published an article in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, The Outcomes of Radical Prostatectomy. Is it the singer, the song, or both? And indeed, the robot will not transform a bad surgeon into a good one, but it helps high volume surgeons to further improve their outcomes and ultimately shorten the learning curve for surgeons in training. But let's look at some of the de details between robotic prostatectomy and laparoscopic prostatectomy 
and then we will go on and discuss open prostatectomy. Indeed, when you look at uh, a publication in 2011 in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, a very uh, good peer-reviewed journal, robotic surgery in the blue line indeed shows better earlier return to continence, 94% versus 83% when compared to those that underwent a laparoscopic procedure. When you look at potency, you can see that potency recovery is significantly better when you see compare it to the laparoscopic approach at 12 months, 77% recovery of the ability to have intercourse versus 32% across the board. Again, in a European uh, uh, urology publication by Portopoa, uh, looking at uh, 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 continence uh, rates in patients, robotic prostatectomy, you can see at three months was 80%, at six months, 88%, and at 12 months, 95% compared to the laparoscopic approach where at 12 months was 83%. When you look at potency across the board, a similar pattern emerges. This publication, again, from the same author, suggests that an 80% potency rate can be achieved at 12 months compared to a 54% with the laparoscopic approach. So indeed, we see these numbers are extremely encouraging for the robotic approach. But let's look at the open approach. As Dr. Lepore has stated that there you know, are many advantages with the open approach, but what are the real advantages? And first, I'd like to focus on perioperative outcomes. Indeed, in this article published in JAMA, men undergoing minimally invasive radical prostatectomy compared to those that underwent robotic can expect a shorter length of stay, fewer respiratory or surgical complications and strictures, and postoperative uh, use of additional cancer therapies will be achieved with the robotic approach. In European urology in, in uh, 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 2012, Jim Hu states that men undergoing a minimally invasive approach experience fewer perioperative and late complications. Although minimally invasive complications decreased over the study period, open prostatectomy complications increased. And indeed, these uh, were associated with higher mortality. Here you can see as a meta-analysis looking at perioperative outcomes. Those to the right of the central line are in favor of a robotic approach versus those to the left are in favor of an open approach. And across the board, in this publication, you can see that perioperative outcomes and complications based on a meta-analysis suggest that the robotic approach is superior. And indeed, when you look at this, robotic prostatectomy can routinely be performed with a small risk of complications. And this cumulative analysis demonstrates that blood loss and transfusion rates were significantly lower with the robotic approach when compared to the open approach. If you look at positive surgical margins and perioperative complication rates, you can see that positive surgical margins for organ-confined disease were similar between two approaches. When you saw disease, PT3 disease, you see it's favoring open surgery, but when we look at intraoperative and perioperative complications, the robotic approach is indeed favored across the board. So indeed, in this meta-analysis, improved perioperative uh, uh, morbidity profiles were seen with the robot compared to the laparoscopic as well as the open approach. Here you can see is results from a nationwide um, uh, inpatient sample base. And indeed, when you look at perioperative and postoperative complications, significantly less with the robotic approach when compared to the open approach. And indeed, the length of stay is much shorter with the robotic approach across the board. Dr. Lepore, who's a very skilled open surgeon, has very low hospital, hospitalization rates. But in the general public, not everyone does have the skill set that Dr. Lepore has. The robotic approach tends to be much better with length of stay compared to the open approach. Here are uh, articles and summaries taken from the AUA updates, 
comparing open prostatectomy, looking at perioperative uh, 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 operative times, blood loss across the board and complication rates. And indeed, when you compare this with the robotic series, the numbers with regards to perioperative, compl perioperative complications is much lower with the robotic approach. Let's look at positive surgical margins and compare this with the open approach. Dr. Lepore, when he does his surgery, indeed we saw his, co his positive margin rate went from 19.8% down to about 9%. One of the early arguments that many open prostatectomy surgeons said is that by feeling the tumor, you could get a better margin in these individuals. And indeed, when you look at this, is palpating the prostate reliable in allowing us to appreciate margins? The answer is no. The majority of these tumors that we find at surgery are not palpable, but indeed, the newer robots now have haptic feedback. Interesting, this doesn't really change outcomes that we've seen in these individuals. If tactile sensation was so important, why are the margins lower with robotics? And indeed, one thing that we have learned with robotic surgery is that we're able to grade the type of nerve spare that we can do. You can see that this is an article that was published in European Urology in 2012, and one can grade the type of nerve spare that was done. Here you see his work from Viv Patel's lab down in Florida. You can see in diagram A, a nice nerve spare is done. You can see this is considered a five out of a score of five for a complete nerve spare being done on a prostatectomy specimen. And you compare that with slide E, where you have extra prostatic extension going into the nerve. This is a grade one type of nerve spare. So the pathologist is able to grade the type of work that we do robotically. And indeed, we can try to predict what some of our functional outcomes may be. Here you can see with MR technology, here is a patient that's having uh, extra prostatic extension. There is a suggestion that the disease extends outside the margin here. And indeed, with this, we can now do what we call a partial nerve spare. So we can look at this. Here you can see our wet clips being placed down. And indeed, the visualization and trying to peel this off where this extra prostatic extension exists we can swing things a little bit wider to try to allow for a better oncological result. And indeed, you can see as we start to peel this tissue away, we can find what we're doing very, very nicely. And the visualization, I think one can appreciate that you can start to see this tissue and peel this away very nicely. So indeed, when we start to look at oncological outcomes with robotic surgery. Here you can see is a meta-analysis published in 2012 in European Urology, clearly favoring to the right robotic prostatectomy with oncological outcomes compared to open prostatectomy. And indeed, when you look at this, you can see that the numbers of these patients across the board, you know, may favor slightly the robotic approach, but clearly there are patients that will benefit with positive surgical margins with the open approach. So contrary to what Dr. Lepore has told you, I believe that the positive surgical margin rates may be slightly lower or at least equal with open prostatectomy across the board. And indeed, here's a multi-institutional study looking at over 22,000 patients that underwent an open laparoscopic and robotic approach you can see that the positive margin with the robot was 13%, where the open prostatectomy was 22% across the board. And indeed, this is statistically significant. So here, positive surgeon margin rates might be lower with a minimally invasive approach compared to an open radical approach. Let's look at our lymph node dissections. And indeed, this is an important part of our operation when we see patients that have higher grade tumors, we sample lymph nodes and can we do as good a uh, sampling as what we've seen with the open surgeons? This is a single group series 
looking that was published in 2012, looking at the impact of a traditional node dissection versus an extended node dissection, both in intermediate and high risk groups across the board. And indeed, intermediate and high risk patients, I think an extended lymph node dissection appears to be better for these patients in this risk group. Here's an article that, pub that was published with regards to bladder cancer by Raj Pruthi down at the University of North Carolina. And indeed, when you look at the robotic sampling, 19 lymph nodes compared to an open 18 lymph nodes, the lymph node count can be very, very comparable across the board. And indeed, when you start to look at the complications with lymph nodes, you can see that not only extended, but limited as well as standard lymph node dissections can be done. And indeed, across the board, the node counts can be quite high and quite good. Pelvic lymph node dissections during robotic surgery can be done effectively and safely. The number of nodes removed, the likelihood of node positivity, and the complication rates were very similar to our open counterpart surgeons. We now have new technology that exists. We can use PET-CT choline studies to try to identify where lymph nodes will be positive and indeed do a lymph node dissection that will encompass these lymph nodes that have a high suggestion of cancer. Here you can see is an extended lymph node dissection. And I apologize, it's being run a little faster because it's quite long. But here you can see this sampling that's taking place the vessels can be peeled off. The tissue on the vessels can be peeled off quite nicely. Clips can be applied for the lymphatic channels. And we can do a large sampling of lymph nodes and be very safe and efficacious to do this nodal dissection quite nicely. The wet clips are being placed on these lymphatic channels. And indeed, you can see the bundle that's removed. Again, on the opposite side, going in, sampling these lymph nodes, clipping these clips with clips to, to uh, uh, stop the lymphatic channels, decrease the risk of lymphocytes. But indeed, you can see that the visualization and teasing this tissue off these vessels can be achieved very safely and effectively with the robotic approach. Let's look at oncological outcomes. Dr. Lepore went to great lengths to look at oncological outcomes comparing robotic surgeons with their counterparts with open surgeons. And indeed, this is a paper that was published by Manny Menon from Detroit in 2010, looking at an analysis of over 1,300 patients. And you can see the chance of biochemical recurrence following radical retropubic uh, robotic process robotic prostatectomy, uh, you can see the five-year follow-up of these patients. Patients with low D'Amico scores do much, much better compared to those with intermediate or high-grade scores. Indeed, the ro robot does offer an advantage in these individuals. Again, another publication in 2012, a single European center looking at five-year follow-up. Again, across the board, we see a very similar pattern to what Dr. Menon has reported across the board with five, uh, seven, and nine year follow-up in these patients across the board. So biochemical free recurrence rates after robotic prostatectomy appear to be consistent with some of the large open series that Dr. Lepore talked about. If we look at a case mix of early oncological outcomes of open and robotic uh, surgeons, you can see that these lines are almost superimposed when you start to follow these patients two, three, and four years out. That indeed, these patients will benefit with a robotic approach. And there's no evidence to suggest that the robotic approach results are worse oncological outcomes, even in patients with higher risk cancer. What about functional outcomes? We talk about potency and functional outcomes. And indeed, this is extremely important when we start to think about how we do our nerve spare operation. And indeed, um, this, as you can see, is the beginning parts of a nerve spare operation where we can dissect off the, the neurovascular bundle 
alongside the prostate and free up the neurovascular bundle for potency. Here you can see is the typical release that's been described by many different robotic surgeons. As we start to peel this out from the medial aspect, there is a prostatic vessel, if you will, that you want to dissect off out laterally, push that vessel out laterally, and that will allow you to be right on the prostate capsule itself to do a nice nerve spare operation. We don't use any electrocautery. We don't use um, uh, heat. Most of the, the injury for potency is usually a traction type of an injury that appears to be uh, self-limited and hopefully will return in some patients. It doesn't return in all patients, but you can see that the neurovascular bundle can be swept off the prostate. Here's a very interesting case from my good friend uh, Vip Patel down at um, a Celebration Hospital. Here you can see it's an apical dissection. Again, remember that the positive margin rates are going to be highest at the apex, but here you can see our uh, pudendal, accessory pudendal vessels that have been preserved. Here you can see is the uh, apical dissection. You can see this has been dissected off beautifully, again, preserving these pudendal arteries that indeed appear to help with potency. But you can see the pudendal arteries extending accessory vessels alongside the side of the prostate, and here the prostate has been dissected off in its entirety. If we look at a retrospective comparison of retropubic and robotic prostatectomy at one institution, this is from Dr. Tawari that was published in 2003. We can see that with the robotic approach as well as the open approach that's illustrated in green, the comparison of potency, uh, of continence, excuse me, in, this, in these individuals was 44 days with the um, robotic approach where you can see the same group of patients was 160 days in these open patients. If we look at current outcomes of these individuals, and again, looking at continence, you can see across the board, this is Dr. Patel's work, looking at what the overall continence is at six months tends to be about 84%, and at 12 months, you can see ranges anywhere from 90 to 97%. Again, more continence uh, uh, data looking at uh, individuals and uh, uh, continence rates at 3, 6, 12, and 18 months. You can see across the board, these numbers are about 56% and 57%. At 12 months, 80 and 80 per, uh, 88% at 18 months. This is a series that was published in 2009. If we then look at continence rates across the board in some of the more recent series, comparing it to open prostatectomy, you can see that in some series they were comparable, but there is a, shite, a slight shift towards the robotic approach with return to continence. I think that we can say comfortably that the return to continence timing appears to be very comparable across the board in these individuals with an odds ratio of 1.53. So for the first time, here is statistical evidence suggesting robotic prostatectomy being better than open and laparoscopic prostatectomy with regards to continence recovery. Again, if we look at um, potency rates, and here you can see is a number of series of individuals across the board, a meta-analysis, if you will, looking at potency rates across the board using validated questionnaires or interviews in these individuals, much what we saw with continence, we now start to see with potency. And indeed, you can see there's one series here that suggests better outcomes with an open prostatectomy, but clearly the majority of these series, and if you look at the odds ratio again, 2.94 times greater chance of return to potency at 12 months with the robotic approach. So again, for the first time, we see a significant advantage in favoring robotic prostatectomy across the board. The question is, what is the promise of trying to do a randomized controlled trial for surgical interventions? Well, I think randomization will be refused by patients. It will lead to poor accrual, which uh, will underpower these studies, 
and blinding the surgeons you know, is going to be impractical and probably not able to be done in these individuals across the board. And indeed, there is difficulty in controlling for the skill set and experience between surgeons and centers across the board. Here you can see is a publication that was published in 2014, a report of the progress report. Each person has been involved or performed greater than 1,000 prostatectomy. Those were the criteria of the surgeons. Various components of the operation were performed by trainee surgeons under close observation. And indeed, when we start, to, there's much promise, as many of you know, in the Olympics when Oscar Pretorius um, was a, a, a runner for South Africa. Indeed, when you start to see early on, there's a lot of promise in individuals, but the question is, is will this promise stick up? And indeed, it's going to be very interesting when this uh, open trial of open and robotic prostatectomy is completed. Dr. Lepore alluded to different costs associated with robotic prostatectomy. And indeed, if you look at open prostatectomy compared to the robotic approach, there's no question that it costs more. The, the surgical costs are fixed and they're much, much higher. But this is an interesting article that was uh, written by Dr. Dasgupta, a good friend of mine that appeared in the British Journal uh, in 2012. Most of the existing studies have failed to mention additional costs associated with treatments of perioperative complications, days out of work, and long-term complications such as erectile dysfunction and incontinence. And if robotic surgery were to yield a better quality of life, this can have an impact in the quality of life, and it may be of little direct importance to the hospital, but it's highly relevant to society as a whole. Indeed, I think we're starting to see different robotic systems being developed. Here you can see is a German robotic system that's being developed in uh, Canada, the Titan robotic system. Indeed, robotic system development is clearly a hot topic. Google Maps and, uh, is teaming with Johnson & Johnson to develop a robot. And there are other robots in Japan and China that are coming down the pike, which will indeed lower the cost and increase competition um, for these robotic systems. There is a steep learning curve associated with robotic surgery. And I can tell you my first robotic prostatectomy took eight and a half hours. My average time now of doing a robotic prostatectomy after over 1,700 prostatectomies is about an hour and a half. So indeed, you get better at doing robotic surgery and indeed, this is a, uh, an article that was published by Andy Vickers um, looking at surgical margin rates after open and radical and ro robotic prostatectomy. That learning curve seems to be, you know, around 500 to really get quite good at this operation. Ways that we can surpass the learning curve are with simulators and virtual mentors. We now have dual consults and we can do remote presence proctoring for individuals to try to get them up to speed. Dr. Lepore showed this slide, and indeed, there has been bad marketing. You know, and, you know, we need to be more truthful when we talk about robotic surgery because the technology does offer a nice advantage for some individuals. Here you can see an article that was published, Can Good Marketing Carry a Bad Product? And this is actually what Dr. Lepore has suggested. But I think marketing can generate short-term success, but the quality is the primary long-term success driver. And indeed, what we're seeing with robotic surgery is we're seeing quality outcomes being obtained across the board. So in conclusion, Dr. Lepore is a very skilled surgeon, but Dr. Lepore is a little behind the curve. Robotics has been widely adopted since it's first come in and it's currently the most common surgical approach for prostatectomy in the United States. And indeed, will become the most common approach across the world in the near future. There's no question that there are better outcomes, and we've seen this with level one evidence, looking at compared to laparoscopic prostatectomy. We, when we start to do a systemic review of the evidence, we can see 
better outcomes and functional outcomes and equivalent cancer control when we compare it to the open approach. But their lack of randomized controlled trials, as Dr. Lepore had said in the literature, the problem is we need to get over it. We need to use this technology. We need to use it as best we can and advance it. As Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the ones that are most adaptable to change. Dr. Lepore, it's time to change. I'd like to thank Dr. Coelho and Dr. Patel for helping me with this presentation. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you both for such an informative presentation. Lots of good information there. Apologies, we do not have time for any uh, question and answers. I do want to thank both our physicians who took their time to spend with us today, Dr. Herbert Lafour and Dr. David Albala. Wonderful information uh, brought to us today. We also want to thank our presenters, uh, labroots.com, the leading scientific social networking site for making this presentation possible. Please visit us at www.labroots.com. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website through March of 2016. We will let you know when it's been put up there for viewing, and we encourage you to forward that invite to any colleagues you may have that could not make today's live broadcast. Thank you again for joining us. See you next time.